Hello. All right. So welcome everybody. All right. It's, it's good to have it in person again. All right. So I'm going to talk about basically hiking a lot and taking lots of photos and doing stuff with it, being inspired by natural things and making art and different code from it. All right. So this, for instance, is in the Pacific Northwest of the United States where I live. All right. This was up on something called Table Mountain. All right. Lots of lots of neat fog rolling in. Uh, way in the distance there is Mount St. Helens, which erupted in 1980. Uh, the Pacific Northwest in general is it's a land of volcanoes. Uh, there's another volcano, Mount Hood. This is from that same trip up Table Mountain. It's a mountain that half of it broke away and slid down into a, a giant river about 400 years ago. So the mountain goes up and there's just sheer cliff. So that's what the fog is rolling over. That's what the fog is... It's a, that's a sheer cliff right on the edge, and the fog just bounces around. There's fog and rain. This is Mount Hood, another above the clouds shots. It's kind of rare that I can time a hike to get above the clouds, but I love it when, when I can get there. There's tons and tons of waterfalls in the area. This one's called Double Falls, a little tiny little falls above, and kind of mini waterfalls behind the actual waterfall. You know, lots of things like that. And here's the part of the Table Mountain where half of it slid away. I, the whole area is built up layer upon layer of basalt, uh, and there's a river called the Columbia River that goes through and has etched down through about a mile worth of basalt. Uh, and there's trails that go all the way up and down all through the, the basalt areas, so you kind of go back in time uh, when you're going hiking. Uh, sometimes the, uh, yeah, the vegetation changes as you as you roam around. I also found the default cube on one of my hikes. <laughs> so uh, this is about two years worth of uh, hiking at this trail, pretty close to where I live. Uh, so the seasons change. If you go to a trail one time, if you come back uh, even at night sometimes or a different season, uh, the vegetation looks all different, but the default cube always looks more or less the same. <laughs> then this one's pretty weathered, so it's it's probably one of the first default cubes, I imagine. Uh, I never quite know if a trail will go up in flames because of global warming or wildfires or, or whatnot. So it's uh, kind of much like proprietary software. So I, I figure I might as well try to experience as much of this stuff before before some corporation decides to destroy it all or something. Uh, oh, the last couple of years, uh, I've had the it's kind of a strange spot in my life. I've had the the uh, resources and the opportunity and the time to just kind of wander around and, and look at the area that I've lived for several decades, but just haven't been able to go out and see a lot of things. And it, like this is, normally you'd hike by this and it was just a tree, but I went by one day and it was just being eaten by fungus. Uh, so with that as a starting point, uh, how do you translate that into, into software or artwork or whatnot? This is called bear grass. It's more on that later. Uh, so, as I've gone out hiking, I, so what does it mean to translate hikes into the, doing that? I, I built up a, quite a collection of, of several thousand photos. I, I usually right after a hike, I'll process them I, and like post something on social media and Mastodon or whatnot. I, I have a, my phone, a Nikon, and an Insta360, and each of those things are very proprietary platforms, which is kind of unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I've heard a rumor that there is a some kind of open source camera, uh, but I, I don't have any experience. I've never met, maybe someone here has experience with open hardware photography. That would be an interesting thing to, to look into. All right. So if you're out in nature, you take all these photos, and if you don't drop your, your camera or your memory card into a river, then you kind of have to deal with them. And open source continues to kind of preaching to the choir here, but uh, open source continues to be a safeguard against crazy decisions by corporations and billionaires that have no qualms about buying up stuff and then demolishing a project or laying off people just because everyone else is doing it. Uh, and these days, as time goes on, there's always more and more options with open source to, to make artwork and from in various kind of genres. And open source can prevent projects from disappearing too. Like if, if a big company destroys your favorite software and you can't edit your soft, your projects anymore, theoretically open source lets you go back and edit things. It's not a guarantee. It's like the repo could dis disappear or a company, for instance, gets on the AI hype bandwagon and 
uh, everyone hates it all of a sudden. You never quite know if something's going to disappear, but open source is probably, I've always found it a, a good option. So usually the first step when I edit photos is to go through Darktable or GIMP. Uh, Nikon produces the uh, big raw files, and Darktable has been pretty good at taking the, those files and converting into, into something usable in other platforms. Uh, then if I, if I don't need super high resolution or I'm not using raw files, then I'll usually edit straight in GIMP and like mess with shadows or whatnot and crop it or, or just do simple things just to get something basically usable. Uh, then the slightly longer story is to, uh, if you have some photos, you can repurpose them in all kinds of different ways. So like the first option is high DPI, I'll use Darktable GIMP, or if I'm, uh, I have this wide-angle camera lens, so I can make panoramas uh, with Hugin, usually. Um, I got the Insta, my brother gave me this Insta360 panoramic camera, which is really convenient. You just press a button and it takes like one second, whereas editing with Hugo takes like up to an hour. Typically one to five hours is about my average to clean up the stitches. But the resolution is much less and the Insta360 puts seams around some of the edges. It disguises it pretty well, but it's you still need to, to edit it somewhat. And for medium stuff like social media, Darktable, GIMP, uh, if you're laying out stuff, Inkscape's pretty good for small stuff, or my own laid out thing I use still occasionally uh, for booklets. Uh, video starts to get into lots of different software used. It's, uh, it's kind of a pipeline. It's not really a linear pipeline. It's more like a, a tree kind of going back and forth between different things. And then video games, which I've been doing the last couple of years, uh, uses just pretty much every software you can think of has a place somewhere in the video game development pipeline. Uh, another issue with, uh, with, with uh, all the different targets is that from a single image, you might have several different versions of things like thumbnails, raw, print, web, edits of each resized for different platforms. Like if you're putting a game on Steam, you need like several different resized images that convey basically the same information, but you still have to edit it. Uh, I've tried different content management systems from time to time, but nothing really works better than just file the basic file system, just loading things up in Nautilus. Uh, it's, you can see everything. I, I wish Nautilus would show the, the file sizes. That's my, my biggest gripe. Uh, also, sometimes Nautilus does not do thumbnail generation all that well. So here's my, my PICA directory, just various sizes. Uh, over a certain size, Nautilus doesn't want to render uh, previews sometimes. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out how to force it to actually render everything that's in the directory. So often I'll just uh, use gthumb, and somehow that's much better at making thumbnails for all the, the files. And then Nautilus uses those thumbnails. There's probably some setting buried in there. I found some obscure foreign posts, but they never seem to work for me for some reason. But other than those minor gripes, the file system is uh, pretty convenient. Just directories by year and month and day. It's pretty straightforward to, to organize things. Uh, I, the last couple of years, I've been using Shotwell for the most part. Uh, sometimes I want to do sort images by tags. Uh, I don't have very sophisticated needs for uh, collating stuff, so Shotwell is a pretty minimal interface. Uh, it can do tagging pretty easily, and it's, it gives you just like a It'll look sort of like this within Shotwell. Uh, I don't think it shows you the, the file size there either, but it does show you the tags underneath the photo, so it's easy to, to kind of group things by tags if I want all the particular flower type or, as, or uh, genre, or, or it, if it has a mountain or a waterfall or whatever, it's, it's been pretty easy. Um, apparently a lot of people like Digicam. I tried to use that a couple of times. But it's, it seems like it's harder to set up. And also, the first time you start Digicam, this, this dialog comes up and asks you to download a, a 300 megabyte binary file from the internet. Something about face recognition, which is it's a, a, little, a little strange to me. So Shotwell's pretty, pretty more minimal and suits my needs. Uh, other things that I generally need in the future, or that I kind of want now, uh, I don't have an adequate... Uh, way to do it. Uh, 
So like if you talk to mushroom hunters or sometimes people find waterfalls out in obscure areas of the wilderness that there's not an established trail to it. So if you talk to them, they might tell you where it is, but they also say, oh, but don't tell anyone else. So it'd be nice to, to have an, an image geotagged in this, this sort of area, but with a kind of an error bar. Uh, that's something I would like to have available at some point. Uh, and they'll talk about some open so open street maps usage later. Uh, one thing about uh, making artwork from source photos, sometimes uh, if it's not photography, you might be trying to do some illustration and you want to have a, a palette, like you see some, some trees that have some interesting colors, or this is a view from Mount St. Helens looking down, you see an, like a nice sunset in the background, um, you might want to develop a, a color palette from that. Um, so I started making a tool called Palatista. Uh, let's see if I can actually get that to run here. There's no real established color format, like each project mostly does their own palette format or gradient format. There's, there's some cross compatibility, I guess. Apparently Inkscape has implemented importing d different kinds of palettes. Oops. Come on computer, don't freeze up on me now. You might have to exit the presentation mode. Uh-huh. Which I just did. <laughs> what would a live conference be without technical difficulties? Yeah. <laughs> I just quit the program and it's still... <laughs> Alright, let's try that for a second. Um, so this is built in Godot. I've been experimenting using the Godot game engine to make different little uh, desktop utilities. I made a little calendar app, a uh, couple other things. Uh, so this one is a palette generator. So for instance, you can just like click down. It's very similar to a, a, a program a certain corporation has made for free online. So hopefully no one sues me for vaguely copying their, their interface. But for, uh, this lets you uh, zoom into things. If you like the sunset, just drag a line, and it selects the, the image. There's stuff from the image. And it tries to squish the points along to get to spread the points over uh, the color gradient, so you get more varied colors. Uh, it gives you either a palette or a gradient, then. I have different exporters, so it can export to GIMP and Scribus colors and uh, Krita palettes, uh, different forms of CSS, or an SVG file that's just a grid of colors. And I just recently implemented the Swatchbook, Swatchbooker SVZ, SVZ format, which is fairly old, but it encapsulates quite a lot of different formats. Uh, it'd be nice to have something like this to be runnable as like some kind of plugin, like Inkscape could call it maybe, or as Krita could call it, and then just automatically import the palette or just have it work out internally in the viewport. All right, now let's see if I can reactivate my slideshow. <laughs>
Yeah, that's the reverse of what I wanted. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, there was. Well, you can say I want to leave off the picture of this question and then. Yeah, there's a somewhere where they are. Oh, I didn't know that. I've used LibreOffice to, to do slideshows like once every year or two, so it's, I at least forget how to use it until I actually need to know. Them. I wouldn't recommend that way of working. Uh, so a side diversion about the, the pika, uh, when you go hiking um, and you look up kind of the area you're going, uh, for instance, my region has these little tiny animals called pikas. They're about this big, like kind of hamster size. They're, they're like little tiny rabbits, basically, without tails. Um, they live in rock sections. Um, that. They're called talus sections. They live inside the rocks. Uh, they come out and, and gather up moss and make little dens. Uh, and usually these areas are in snow areas, or they're covered with snow in the winter. Um, so the pikas uh, build up little nests and survive through the, through the winter. Uh, over time, global warming is going to going to threaten these these habitats because the, the rocks will be too hot and they don't really adapt well to other sorts of terrain. Um, so this, this is an illustration using the palette from Mount St. Helens, uh, kind of about the pika after someone has, has engineered it to be more like 100 feet tall and attacking the humans who have made their, their habitat inhospitable. Uh, so that's kind of, it was kind of an overview of, of how to make palettes and process images uh, so now you have a bunch of stuff stacked on your hard drive. So uh, what about sharing? Um, for that, I've been learning how to use Hugo, which is a static website generator. I've used WordPress for a while, uh, but from time to time, WordPress version will update or the PHP server version of uh, will update. And somewhere in the long, somewhere in there, there's like uh, errors that are, are really difficult to track down occasionally. Whereas Hugo, uh, you write stuff in Markdown, you build it, and then you put the files online. It's like no fuss, no muss most of the time. Um, you can make it more complicated uh, with different like JavaScript libraries to do stuff. Uh, but on the whole, it's it's much easier than WordPress. And you can like map it to a repo, have something, take the repo, and then build your website. And then it's, it's live pretty quickly. It's very easy to use. Uh, so with my hiking stuff, I launched a new site called Hiker Tunist. Uh, something about cartooning and hiking. I still haven't quite figured out exactly what I'm doing with it, but it's all built in Hugo. Uh, I'm still coding everything by hand. I guess Hugo has some uh, some outside tools that let you like use a GUI to uh, organize content, but if, I haven't used them. Uh, if anyone has recommendations, I would love to talk to you about that later. I'm not an expert really in any of these things, but this is just the, the pipeline I've kind of sunk into. All right, so I, in Hugo, it's very easy to extend things to. Um, so for instance, I added a, a latitude and longitude options uh, right in, in a post so I can tag approximately to places that I have I want to post about. Um, so this is the OpenStreetMaps little widget. I, I wrote to pull a map from OpenStreetMaps from these coordinates, and then on a website, you can have uh, when you're making a post, you just use the little thing down at the bottom, and then it takes the latitude and longitude and squishes it into all that other gobbledygook. Um, so you can have little maps on on posts. It's very easy to do, and I don't think I'll I'll demo this out of caution. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's a this library I found called Penelum that does uh, panable um, uh, panoramas, um, so you can just drag them around with your mouse. Uh, and I wrote an, another short code for Penelum that takes the uh, 360 image and then puts it in a box on a web page. It's very easy to, to implement. Uh, if I was trying to do that in WordPress, I think it would probably be a bit harder. 
the hardest thing I found using Hugo is figuring out the processing order of things. Um, in the Hugo directory for a site, it's, there's all these different directories, and some override the others, and some are just resource directories that get processed into a different directory. Um, so once you figure out the initial setup for things, then it becomes pretty easy to use Hugo. Whereas in contrast with WordPress, for instance, every single stage is is like a, a research adventure to figure out why it's doing something or not doing something. So on the whole, Hugo is, has been very nice. Um, so that was kind of a, an overview of uh, traditional forms of, of art, photography, and illustration, um, processing things to view on the on the web. Uh, but I've also been getting into game dev the last few years, uh, mostly with the Gado engine. Um, so these flowers are from uh, a mountain nearby that's uh, right about now, this time of year. Um, it's, it's called balsa root. It blooms on across the whole top of a, a mountain. It's it's very pretty. So I've been trying to figure out ways to take different elements from nature and put them into a, a traversable world in games. Uh, before starting to go going hiking a lot, uh, my main game dev projects were uh, VR space station stuff. I haven't quite abandoned that project, but uh, the more I got like. Here you see just a big cavern. It's pretty much just dirt with a few buildings on the ends. Uh, so if you if you go to the trouble of having jetpacks to fly around, it's still pretty boring in the middle. So uh, uh, that's why I started to, or one of the reasons I started to figure out how to make vegetation and things. Uh, so when you make something about vegetation, then you start learning about the vegetation and it grows a certain way in certain conditions. And then trying to simulate that with code, it's uh, the more you dig in, there's more stuff to figure out. And it's just an adventure to figure out game elements. Then the other way to ins be inspired by nature is things like the COVID virus. So this was my, my Beat Saber clone. Got to use your little lightsaber syringes to, to battle COVID. I, I made a separate level for this where instead of instead of syringes you have to fight the virus with machine guns but machine guns were very ineffective it's i wouldn't they are contraindicated for treatment of, of covid <laughs> um so like kind of just what happens when i've been I, I used to make a lot of comic books i haven't really made many comic books lately uh, but I made my own software called Layout to make my comic books with. Uh, and I end up make, spending way more time making tools to do stuff with artwork than making artwork itself. And it's it's uh, been kind of getting that way with uh, 3D stuff also, like starting with space station stuff and then uh, building up kind of hiking experiences. Uh, I loved figuring out how to make tools in Godot to make stuff rather than making actual games. It's, I'm not sure if that's a, a good thing or not, but it keeps me busy. Uh, and Godot has uh, many different ways to uh, make custom scripts. Um, for instance, uh, like Blender, you can uh, make a script to do something and you just run it and it does something and then you're done. Or you can make a script that's attached to a particular object or a particular object type uh, that can access the directly properties of something and then the tool does something with it or you might some want something inside the inside a uh, inside the viewport so dragging things down in this case uh, making english ivy consume a, an old skeleton and english ivy is a invasive species in the pacific northwest but they kind of look nice so uh, uh, one thing Godot does not have is uh, an adequate package manager for plugins. <clears throat> um, so you can make tools that operate as plugins within the Godot editor, which means you can toggle them on and off. Uh, and it also has a built-in asset lib. It's like a, I'm not sure why Godot gives them a whole button on the main UI. But up at the top, in the middle of the editor, there's asset lib. You push that, and then you can go to where there's a collection of things you can just download directly into your project. But there's no package manager, so if there's conflicts between files, uh, you're kind of you're kind of on your own figuring out dependencies. So 
Godot is pretty pretty young in terms of usability, uh, but there are so many people working on it now, and it, every year it gets more and more popular. Um, so these little these these quirks are being ironed out as time goes on. Uh, one thing about uh, Godot plugins, um, I always like to have tools that have weird widgets on screen that you can drag around. Um, I always feel like I'm failing if I have to go to a box on the side of the screen and, and twiddle with things. Sometimes that's fine, but uh, it's kind of more fun to have like the cursor there is just a, a little object. Uh, everything in Godot is built on a scene graph, uh, and the little uh, mouse indicator basically is just another 3D object in the scene. But uh, a clever thing that Godot does is have the owner of objects be assignable. So you can make any little strange widget you want in the Godot editor, but it will not save with your scene and clutter up your, your graph with, with little widgets. Um, you have a lot of control over what those widgets do and how it responds to, to mice and things like that. Uh, so on the whole, making tools in Godot is, uh, it has quite a lot of options. Uh, this was another tool I made to make procedurally generated bridges. Uh, the islands are also generated procedurally, but the, they're, they're kind of boring. I think the, the bridge is a little more interesting. Um, the vines, basically, you draw something on the screen and you do something with the line. And this is basically doing the same thing, only it's you're caring about the endpoints. Um, then this has the widget on screen, plus there's little things on the side of the, the those knobs that I don't really want to fiddle with, but they make it convenient. You can, you spend like five minutes making something in a box instead of five days on a, a widget to respond to, to mouse inputs in the viewport. Uh, one downside of, of making editor tools that spawn lots of little objects in Godot um, is that frame rate can be quite a challenge if you're uh, spawning objects and deleting objects all the time. Um, so that's why the bridge doesn't update while you're moving. It would be nice to have it immediately display what it's doing. There's ways around that to optimize different object usage. Uh, I, just, I need to spend some more time on that. And uh, let's see, Terry, how am I doing for time? Hmm. I think I'll just describe this one. I don't want to risk more technical failure. I made a, a another plugin to do procedural bear grass. Um, so these things, uh, when they're not blooming, they're just a little puff ball of grass on the ground. And when they do bloom, a big stalk comes out and they look kind of like alien pods or something. Um, so I made a, a plugin so you can spawn a whole patch of things kind of like this. Uh, and in the in the editor control the height and the, the puffiness and the the way uh the the stocks are leaning like if you have a the sun moving around in your game world uh then you can kind of change which direction the, the plants are leaning uh let's see and here's some other other ghetto methods in particle systems uh, usually particle systems are based on 2d images uh so there, there's still many ways to use 2D things derived from 2D imagery back into uh, 3D worlds. I think the snowflake on the left, for instance, uh, I didn't make that one. I got I downloaded a picture from Unsplash, and thus I cut out the the snowflake. Uh, but uh, video games have lots of interactivity, and it's it's a lot of fun to try to figure out how things should be interacted with, and whether they make splashes in the middle there or just drift around like pollen. I haven't implemented procedural sneezing yet, but it's <laughs> perhaps in the future. One of my many unfinished projects. Uh, fortunately, I took a video of this one this morning instead of relying on a, a live demo. Uh, this was uh, uh, my most recent ghetto tool I'm trying to implement. Uh, I have all, tons and tons of photos of different waterfalls. Um, so one of my unfinished game projects is to have a, a video game where the goal is to restart waterfalls. Like you come to a, a dead rock and you have to figure out how to get water flowing from point to point. And there's, there's lots of different classifications for waterfalls. So each kind of level would be a different form of waterfall. Uh, but one problem with waterfalls, making them in, in games is to, uh, instead of modeling everything to go over the train, just uh, simulate them and drop a bunch of, of, droplets 
uh, have them run as rigid bodies over a terrain, then depending on the path they trace, uh, make a mesh like that. Um, this was based on uh, sort of a technique from Ghislaine Girardo on YouTube, and he got it from someone who posted it on Twitter about a year ago, uh, doing kind of simulations like this and then building meshes. Uh, uh, Ghislaine's YouTube goes into much more detail about instead of having a single like a single mat that goes over the points, have uh, interacting kind of ribbons and have the ribbons undulate and have different like perpendicular planes between different paths uh, so that it looks more or less, it tricks the eye into thinking it's more 3D depending on which angle you look at it. Um, so there's lots of different uh, waterfall things to work with. I still haven't figured out a good way to do interactivity in Godot for running water. Um, I've seen some projects that have some running water, but usually they're confined to very particular areas, uh, depending on how far the water should be going. Uh, it's it's tricky to have actual interactivity, like if you want to have splashes or if you want to stick your hand into a waterfall and have the water divide. It's, there's still so many problems to work out, so perhaps I'll be diverted into figuring out those problems instead of making actual artwork still. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of custom tooling. Uh, both Blender and Godot have lots of ways to expand the interface, for instance. Uh, Blender, like Godot, has those one-off scripts. Blender is Python-based. Uh, it has quite an extensive uh, array of stuff you can do with it. Um, and Blender, uh, one thing I love about that is that there's a little command console. So when you do something, this goes to that command console, and then you can just immediately select uh, all that command, not only the Python command, but all the parameters that you're sending to that command. It makes building up custom scripts like quite easy, as easy as it can be for writing low-level Python stuff. Uh, you can also, like Ado, add to any of the panels in Blender, and oftentimes you can insert stuff into different menus. Uh, you can put custom variables on objects to do different things. Uh, and uh, geometry nodes in Blender is kind of the latest hot thing. There's like so many things of people using blend geometry nodes to do some pretty amazing graphics work. And uh, this was something I implemented in my laid out software. Uh, it's not 3D, it's just 2D, but it's based on node systems. Um, so you just mess around with nodes and then do uh, create various uh, vector graphics stuff. And shortly after I made this, uh, Blender, this was a few years ago, and then uh, Blender announced the geometry nodes, which kind of took off. And, and really, that kind of took the wind out of my sails a little bit for, for working on this, because geometry nodes was so good. But uh, over time, I think like some a specifically 2D uh, realm for this kind of thing is still useful, because Blender is still very geared toward 3D manipulation. And I haven't really worked on laid out too much lately because I haven't made a new comic book. Usually, if I have a new comic book due, then I'll I'll work on laid out to iron out bugs. But I kind of feel bad about that. Just need to make more comics. Uh, no one piece of software is going to do everything. Uh, even uh, in different circumstances, one tool is going to be better. Uh, and no matter how robust the a roadmap is for something, it's it's. And I think it's important to have uh, custom tooling available. And different programs uh, do it to a certain extent. I kind of, this weekend, would love to talk to some guys in particular about capabilities for, for custom tools there. Uh, every few years, I try to make some some uh, custom tools in Inkscape for like on-canvas uh, manipulation of things. And I, I kind of get, get a little confused too much and then abandon investigation. So it's been a few years since I've tried to do that, so the, the window's open to to doing that again. Uh, I read somewhere that the Inkscape uh, has uh, more customizable nodes or something, uh, like you can change the size or something. Uh, anyway, at some point I would love to talk to, with you guys about that. Uh, Krita, it's, I haven't tried to make a Krita plugin but uh, judging from videos, it seems like there's a lot of uh, on-canvas stuff that you can do with Krita. Uh, Krita is much more geared toward painting rather than vector graphics stuff, so it's slightly different needs. 
Uh, but there's still there's still options for that. And I guess that's all I prepared on making art from nature. I guess there's questions. I'm um, kind of a, so the question is, uh, what's kind of the fidelity to the natural terrain? Um, is it just like interpretive or is it more like how that mountain is actually shaped? Uh, kind of a mix of those things. Uh, uh, one project that's I've only just thought about, I just have a, a couple of pages of notes, um, is taking uh, open street map based topology data and then translating that into actual terrain. Uh, the idea being to build up a kind of a map of different hiking things. Um, so that would be my, within my ideal content management system is to be able to have this like clickable map to uh, zoom in on, on different trail details or what it does it, what's it look like in spring? What did it look like in winter in 2022 or something? So if I have uh, data to do that, I think that would be pretty cool. I found some Blender plugins that I, uh, I let you do that, like select some a square of latitude and longitude, and it downloads the a satellite picture plus topology. I, I, I've tried to make that into in Godot, but the the image file that codes the uh, the height map, um, I don't think I'm interpreting that quite correctly yet because the my terrain comes out more skewed. It's like I, I haven't found the correct mathematical interpretation to to get the appropriate terrain. All right. Thank you again.